Let us remain standing in this hour, heads, for a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it is again that we approach Thee asking forgiveness of our sins and trespasses and praying that You'll be merciful to us, Father. We would pray, Lord, that You would pardon all of our transgressions, would lead us into the paths of light and life, and make us, Lord, so salty that others would long to be Christians in whom we contact. We know that salt is a savior if it contacts. Father, we pray that you will make us the strength of the salt, and may we be so desirous to contact the outside world that's dying, yes, yes. that it might be a savior to them. We are told that we are written epistles read of all men. Father, we pray that our lives will so be as we profess to have this great experience of Pentecost, that it will be such a, a salty to the world that they'll long to be that way also. Give us to thy Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might show to the world that our faith in our Savior is confirmed that he is not dead but he's living with us day by day, guiding us and directing us, feeding us, walking by the still waters and the shady green pastures. We pray that you'll bless us tonight in the Word. Heal the sick and the afflicted. Save the lost. Give glory unto thy great name, for we ask it in thy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> We are indeed deemed this a grand privilege to be back again tonight here at the church to minister again the word to the people. And this has been a great day. I'm so glad to meet Christians, to meet real born again people. Um, I hope you don't think that I expressing and saying the things that I do that I think that California has all the sinners. Uh, they're all over the world. And uh, I last evening when I was approaching, I'd been down in the city in the afternoon, and I noticed the, some the peoples of how they were doing, just like they are in other parts of the world. And I come in last night, and nicest little girl from the platform here from the choir, I believe it was, walked back there. She was a Canadian, real nice little lady, clean looking, and a real, just a real lady. I hope my Rebecca is like that when she gets her age, a Canadian girl. And then tonight coming in, standing out there by the side of the wall, stood a, a little lady standing out there with my son and my daughter-in-law come up. And I, from Arkansas, waiting out there in the cold just to shake hands with me. He said she'd remember when I was in Hot Springs many, many years ago, the Humbert family. And just see people like that, it just makes life worth living. You know, we, we live to serve and to do what we can for those people and to try to help others that maybe doesn't know the joy of living that life. Some people think that when you become a Christian that it ta just takes all the joy out of life. It's just vice versa. I, I have uh, lived both ways. This is 31 years I've been preaching, and I, have, I would not trade this life if there wasn't even any heaven to go to at the end of it. There wasn't any Jesus to see. I have more joy living this way than I one day than I would ten years any other way, if there wasn't nothing after. But that's really from my heart as, as your brother and God's servant. It's such a peace and a satisfaction knowing that when you lay down, if you never wake again, what difference does it make? You're, you're, you're saved, that, that anchor that holds within the veil, somewhere out there, something that tells us that the good's just the other side. 
Billy said last night to me when I left, he said, Daddy, do you think you could ever make it sometime you get out at 9 o'clock? I said, I hope so sometime. <laughs> but I, you're such a nice people to talk to, and you, there's no place to stop. And he said, well, the first thing, you talked about 30 minutes before you ever start on your sermon. I said, now, Billy, I'm going to finally go do that tonight. I'm going, to, I'm going to start right straight into the sermon right quick. So I let the people out. We've got a, still a full week. And then we got to go from here then up into Visalia and right straight from there to Ohio, back in the snow, and down in Virginia, where I think we got 17 inches of snow in there now. And then back over in Illinois, Bloomington, up Chicago, and then all the way up in northern British Columbia, where it's really snowing. And then I hope that the Lord willing sometime this uh, summer to, to get overseas again, because that's where my heart lays. That is true. But you would too. You think, well, you don't love us. Yes, I love you. But you're already anchored in Christ. And those people over there are just so hungering and thirsting. And now if I was working for you and I could pick, I was picking berries on one side of the road over here, I could pick 50 gallons a day. On this side of the road, I could pick two quarts a day. Of which field should I work in? Certainly. You know what I mean. But one thing about having meetings here. The American people has the money, and they're the ones that have to sponsor. Those people can't even eat over there, but what? And it's just a terrible, you'd never realize what it is. It won't strike your heart until you stand in the street sometime preaching and seeing a little mother with her little baby in his belly swelled up that high dying for hunger and trying to hand you the baby. She knows she's going to die too, starving. Well, why if you take that one here, it's one over here, and one here, and one here, and one just everywhere, you see? And it's a pitiful thing. Then you come back and think that we rake in the garbage can enough to feed those people. And there's just something, the economics of the world is not balanced right somewhere. Right. It's just not right. And we can't do nothing about it. You can see it, but see, I'm just one American, and, that, and just one Christian. And we can come back and tell the stories. And it's truth that many missionaries tonight are eating one or two meals a week and without shoes on their feet, just an old pair of ragged trousers or something wrapped around them, going into the jungles preaching the gospel, this gospel that we're preaching right here. It just isn't right. It just doesn't seem right. Although they don't complain, they go right ahead doing it anyhow. This almost breaks your heart to see... I say, that fellow there, he's a missionary. And we was in Durban, South Africa. That's where I had, I guess, the largest altar call the Lord ever gave me. We registered 30,000 converts at one altar call. Just think of that. 30,000 blanket natives received Christ as personal Savior when they seen taking place just like you seen here last night. They're hungering and thirsting. And when they see something's out of reality to it, but see, we here in America, uh, we just have all kinds of advances, and if one don't please us, we just drop him off, get another one, and, you know, we just, and it's such a variety, and the, and the first thing you know, why it all becomes so common to us that we just forget about it. Those people are really craving God. I've seen little black boys stand like that, little children, never know what a suit of clothes was, never know... Well, we had some homemade ice cream, and one of them had come up, and I put it in his hand. He dropped it and screamed out. I asked Mr. Or the man was standing with me, what did he say? He said, boss, it burnt me. <laughs> it was cold, you see. He never had felt nothing cold, you see. He said, it burnt me. See them down there when they go to get their drinks, and the crocodiles chaw them up. Uh, see them coming for many as two months ahead of time when they heard I was coming over there to pray for their sick. They go along packing their loved ones on homemade stretchers, boards, and whatever they could have. And when they would, a lion would come, they would shin him up a tree somewhere till the lions left and bring him down. Such a sacrifice down through the jungles. And then to see him laying at least four or five city block deep, so you can't even see the end of them like that, laying there. Just, and when they seen one man healed at the platform, I turned and threw 15 different interpreters. If you just have to write down what you said last. But when I asked them, had the missionary told them what this great Jesus was? Yes. But he had also told them that the days of miracles was past. I said, now what was he then? 
Whatever he was then, he remains the same if he's a living. See? And when they seen that proof that he was, I made just a prayer, a congregational prayer, and Dr. F. F. Bosworth, did anybody ever hear him? And most everybody. One of the grandest old saints I ever met in my life. He estimated between 25 and 30,000 spontaneous miracles taking place at one time. The next morning, Mr. Sidney Smith, the mayor of, of, of Durban, called me and said, uh, watch the window towards the seashore from your hotel room. I said, what is it? I'll see if I can get there in time. It's on its road. Well, I was sitting there and I wondered, what did the mayor mean? And just that night, there had been a woman had died over there that day. A friend of his prayed for her. She'd come to life. The paper's given big headlines about it. Now, I went up, see where people really humble themselves and forget everything else and just believe on the Lord. Just everything takes place. And then, but you have to believe it. That's all. Just, not, not just strain at it, but just simple believe it. Just, but, and so they called. And I heard something making a noise and I went down the street. Now, they have, they have tribal wars among them. But when I walked to the platform, there was 15, I know, different tribes. They're all in there with their witch doctors and the chiefs and so forth. And they all stand with one accord, about nearly 200,000, and sing each one in their native tongue, all blending together, all things are possible. <laughs> Brother Bosworth said he had trained symphonists and went to a Madison Square Garden with a hundred and something piece uh, uh, orchestra. And he said, never, said some of them would be an octave high and octave low trained voices, but said there, there was just every one of them. You wouldn't know which is right and left hand. Just perfect music. I can just see him as he took off his glasses and then wiping his eyes. He said, Brother Brown, this is by carnation to hear that. Uh, said, that's the Holy Spirit. It's the only thing you could make him sing. And the next day when I went to the window and looked out, I thought my heart would jump from me. I looked, coming down the street, there comes seven of those big African uh, uh, vans. They're just about long as from here to the all across this building almost. Got some four to six wheels under them. And they were piled just as high as they could be piled with old boards and clubs and things that those people had walked on the day before. And the ones that had walked on them was walking behind for city blocks. Six of those, big, seven of those big van fulls like that coming down the street with their hands up in the air, was crippled the day before, saying all things are possible on the road. I tell you. You see what I, what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's, your heart just bleeds to get to them again. You just jump to see what you could do for them. And I got a paper, one of the Durban papers, that said that one tribe, the Shungai, I forget how much that they brought back weeks later. And they was... And when they come back, they were through with sin, bringing back firearms and watches and what they'd stole from the, living out in the compounds, you know, and come into the city and steal. Now, you pardon me, my sisters, for this rude expression. And do not think that I'm trying to make something uh, push this hard, but I just want just to ask you one thing. We're supposed to live in a, a land of civilization. And this baptism of the Holy Spirit that we talk about, I've seen people receive the Holy Spirit that didn't know right and left hand. And you know what they do when they receive it? They act just like you do when you receive it. Do the same thing. And they don't know which is right and left hand. And standing on that ground were women standing there just as no clothes, no more than there was born in. And there they stood there, young and old and all alike. And I asked them, I said, now, I want you, to, would you receive this Jesus that's made this man that was all crippled up to stand up straight and walk? Or told him, and I said, I, is your witch doctors, I thought I was reading his Bible. I said, now, it shows the God of heaven has made him well. I said, how many wants to receive him as personal Savior? And they raised up thousands. Brother Baxter and them said, I believe they must have meant physical healing. I said, start it through the interpreters again. I said, I did not mean physical healing. I meant to receive Christ, someone who loves you. And I realized that you've got a raw end of it. You're just like our American Indian got over there, where God placed him in the land. But I said, uh, you, you got a bad deal out of it, but there's one that will give you justice. That's the Lord Jesus. And you want to receive him as your personal Savior, you can go home to heaven. And I said, raise your hands. If them is packed idols, break them on the ground. And they 
broke their idols and raised up their hands, 30,000 blankets even. I said, while you had your hands up, receive Jesus for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when they did that, them people, some women standing there, naked, just a cloud, you know what they've done to walk away from that? They folded their arms to walk away. Now, what's a strange thing to me? That a woman that don't know right and left hand, and as soon as Christ comes to her heart, she realizes she's naked. And she'll try to hide herself, and we who are supposed to be a Christian nation continually take it off. Can you explain it to me? Uh, I just want to ask that question. Uh, and all, I don't mean that to joke. This is not no place to joke. This is the death, the pulpit of God. See? But uh, isn't that true? It, can you make sense out of it? A lady that knows nothing about God and as soon as Christ comes to heart, they realize they're naked. And we who are supposed to be Christians constantly cheer just as much as the law will keep them running you off the street, taking it off every day. Something's wrong somewhere. Maybe it, it might be me. It just might be me it's wrong. I don't know. If I'm wrong, then the word's wrong. <laughs> I like to stay with the word. Now, forgive me, Billy. <laughs> I did it again. <laughs> I believe I had Brother Borders to read some, I got some announcements here, but I'll just get them a little later because they get too late, and I'm going to try to get out at 9 o'clock if I possibly can. Now, I want to take from that scripture reading out of Genesis, the 22nd chapter, and the last 10 verses of the um, 17th verse. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemy. Now we've been studying on Abraham and how that God was with Abraham and what he did for him. And last Saturday night, we left Abraham in old where God had turned him and Sarah back to a young man and young woman. Did you like that? Do you believe it? Went back and she had the baby. And we prove that by the scripture that Sarah was a young woman because it was a young king down there, Amalek, that fell in love with her. And I got a little note on it. It said, Brother Brown, they just lived longer that day. Someone a little disagreed. Well, that's just all right. But I would like to make that clear to you, my brother. You notice the scripture said, and they were both well stricken in age. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. They were old. And so he turned them back to a young man and a young woman showing what he's going to do to all the seed of Abraham. Now, we see those great promises that he gave. Then we find out that Abraham was sterile. Sarah, or perhaps, was barren. Perhaps Sarah was one that was barren. But after Abraham being his own body, as the Bible said in Romans 4, as good as dead, and we find out that yet 40 years after that, when he's Wife died and he married again. He had seven other sons besides his daughters after that. So you see, just you're in between the lines, you see, God just done something for them. That's right. He just turned them back and made them a young couple again. I'm so glad that I have the opportunity and can bring one of the greatest treasures to the people that there is in the world to tell them that we are heirs with Abraham of this promise. We are Abraham's children. How do we do it? By joining the church, no, by being deity Christ, receiving the Holy Spirit, then we are Abraham's seed and our heirs with him according to the promise. Don't fail to get it, Christian friends. Stay with it. If I do a little whistling like while I'm speaking, all of you know that I used to be a pugilist. I used to box. I had the three state championship. Never lost for one fight in my life. And I smiled at a guy one time when he, he hit at me and missed me and he smacked me right in the mouth. And... It's not two teeth loose. I broke the corner off one, and just the other day I lost the filling out of it. So uh, I do a little bit of whispering. <laughs> I was thinking one time how bad that was, and I remember Mrs. Graham, for the noted evangelist Billy, said that the one of the great times of his life that he's got one tooth out in front, he wears a parcel, and he lost this tooth. And it's just about time for him to go on the broadcast, and he said, this whistle's terrible, and he just... And he had to stand to the microphone and said, Oh, Billy was really doing some praying. And a porter and everybody looking to the bell officer, trying to find this tooth where it was at, come to find out it fell out of his trouser pocket and it's in his shoes. Somebody found it down one of his shoes. And 
and she told it on him while she was in Louisville. And um, so the next he did, he would take a towel after taking a bath and throw it on the top of the door like that and make a big dirty streak and she was too short to get up and wipe it off, you know. So we all have our faults, you see, all of us, even to the best. So we find that Abraham and Sarah now had received this little one at the age of about 12 years old. He was taken, asked by God or to take his own child up on the mountain and sacrifice, take his life. And Abraham did not disbelieve God because he knew that if he, that if he obeyed God like he had waited for 25 years, that if he received him as one from the dead, now what about that, whether you're old or not, uh, receiving him as one from the dead, know that he was fully persuaded he was able to raise him up again from the dead. See? Because he was just as good as dead, his life within him as the male was dead, and Sarah, the womb was dead, and she was just, he just received him as one from the dead. So uh, he knew that God could raise him up if he kept his promise. Then we see when full obedience comes, then when he was about to take the life of his own son, the angel of the Lord called from the skies and held his hand, and there was a ram behind him. And he took the ram that had been caught the weeds by his, or the vines by his horns and offered the ram instead of his own son. And we discussed at that, where did this ram come from? Now, Abraham was three days journey and then lifted up his eyes far off and seen the mountain. He is at least 75 to 100 miles from civilization and up on top of a mountain where there's no grass or no water. And he'd roll the rocks around and fix the altar, and there was no ram there. And if a ram would be up there, animals had killed it long ago, straining out like that. And that's the reason he called it Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. I believe God spoke the ram into existence. And we found out that it wasn't a vision. A vision don't bleed. He killed the ram, and the blood run out of the ram. And he offered that instead of his own son. You know who that ram was? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly that. And figurative speaking, that was him. Then God was so pleased with complete obedience. God had tried his patriarch. He had tried his servant. And every son that cometh to God must be what? Tried. Chastened. That's where that many fall away because we can't stand that trial. A person comes to the altar, time of revival, and you watch just a little while when the hot trials begin to come. Jesus plainly taught it, said the sower went forth sowing seed, some fell by the wayside, some fell into stony ground and among thorns and thistles, and the others fell over in good ground. And he said that's the way the word went, goes out. Some hears the word go out, birds come off, pick it up. See, they don't, don't do no good at all. Others come up overnight. Oh, they're going to do great things, but when the trials begin to come, it chokes them down. But some goes all the way over into good ground, and that brings forth a hundredfold. Let's be the hundredfold. Let's go way over it. Sell out everything from the world and look to Christ and believe Him with all of our hearts. That's how these things happen. That's how visions come. That's how the power of, the God, of God moves among us. It's when we're at no roots of bitterness and everything's cleaned out and the Holy Spirit can work to us, then we become a channel. What if there was a short in this speaker tonight? You'd never be able to hear me. It'd be all full of static. You wouldn't know what I was saying. Well, that's just like we are. That's a, that's a mute until something makes a noise in it. It cannot speak itself. And that's the way we are. We know nothing about the heavenlies, but it takes the Holy Spirit to come down and use our eyes for vision, our lips for words and prophecies, and, and, and speak the words and watch the things happen. That's what you will in my name, it shall be done unto you, see? If ye abide in me and my words in you, ask what you will, and it will be done unto you. Verily really, I say to you, if you say to this mountain, be moved, and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you have said will come to pass, you can have what you said. St. Mark 11, 22 and 23. Now we know that those things are true. Now we find that Abraham first was tried, and after he had endured the trial. And what does the Bible say that we are if we cannot stand the chastisement of God? Then we become illegitimate children. So-called children, but not real children of God. 
The children of God knows exactly where they stand. They know where they put their hope, their faith, their trust. Nothing will ever shake them from it. All the Father has given me will come. That's right. And now, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life and shall never come into condemnation, but has passed from death unto life. There's the scripture. The St. John 5, 24. They believe it. They've accepted it. If something happened to them, they become a new creature. They're a new nature. They're, they're a new being. A new creature there, the Greek word it says new creation. It's a new creation. You have been recreated again from what you were to the image of a son of God and a daughter of God. It's just such an off, it's the greatest miracle that ever happened when a sinner can be made to become a Christian. For instance, here's a thorn tree growing. It, it's life, it's thorn tree. And it's got uh, thorns all over it. And it's got a funny looking leaf on it. Now you see it takes something besides any human work to change that thorn tree and make them thorns go off of it and just unfold and be real pretty smooth leaves and bear oranges. Now see what would have to take place. You'd have to transfer the life of an orange tree into that thorn tree. And then it would actually bear oranges because the life inside of it is orange. Of course you couldn't do that naturally. It won't, it won't cross that way. But that's what we are. Like we, we are now a, a wheat, a grain of wheat in God's garden when we was a cup of earth. And God changed us from a cup of earth to a grain of wheat. Mr. the fruit's different. Changing your own mind, your own ideas. It's the greatest miracle that ever happened when a man or a woman is born again of the Spirit of God and becomes a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now, we find then that God told Abraham, because you have did this and give the patriarch of this great uh, trial, he said, your seed shall possess the gates of the enemy, of his enemy. Enemies, it's in the plural. They shall possess the gates of the enemy. Now, his seed, now who is he talking about the seed? The seed is the church. How do we come to church? Not by joining it. But by being born into it. Right, you see, I, I believe that we have our, our organization, our denominations, and them things are all right. But that don't put us in the church. Right. We could join every one of them and still not be in the church. You don't, you're not joined in the church. You're born in the church. Right. You become the family of God. I've been in the Branham family for 51 years, and they never did ask me to join the family. Because I was a Branham at birth. I was born in the family. Yes. I, I'll be a Branham by birth. That's how you become a Christian by birth. When you're born again, you become a new creature, a new creation Hallelujah. in Christ Jesus. And all old things have passed away and all things have become new again. What a wonderful... I'd like to ask the church one thing. What greater treasure could you find on earth tonight? What could you find that you would swap for this whole... Why, there couldn't be nothing that would no way touch it anyway uh, for this great home. Now, but the, remember, thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemy. The seed shall possess. Now, he's talking now of Abraham's seed. And how do we become Abraham's seed? By being dead in Christ. Galatians 3. We, when we are dead in Christ, we become Abraham's seed. See, we, we're dead to the things of the world and begin a new creature in Christ Jesus. Then the Holy Spirit that was in Christ is in us and that makes us Abraham's seed and gives us Abraham's faith. Yeah, yeah. See, that's the reason people say, oh, I wouldn't believe in divine healing. I was talking to a certain minister, nothing against the man, he's got a right for his ideas. He's an American, the same as we are. And he said... Uh, Brother Bram, I don't care if you could produce 10,000 miracles. It's still, I do not believe in healing. I said, certainly not. It, it wasn't for unbelievers. It was just for those who believe. See? That's right. It's, it's not for unbelievers. It was only meant for believers. That's all. This Holy Spirit is to them that believe. Divine healing is for those who believe, not unbelievers, it's believers. Hallelujah. Now, you know, they, Jesus came right at the time they were preaching against it and everything else, but he went right on healing just the same. 
And uh, no matter how much they talk about, there's no such a thing as the Holy Spirit, the people go out on receiving it just the same. See? They might not be able to explain it. They can't explain how many uh, molecules there is to an inch or how many uh, miles it is to the moon, but they know they receive something and they're enjoying it. And this is not a joke, but it was told in the Christian businessman recently at one of the meetings. It was an elderly colored sister who wanted to testify. She said it kind of southern way. She says, I always want to give my testimony. She says, I was not what I want to be. And I was not what I ought to be, but still I ain't what I used to be. <laughs> so, I think that's the way the church might be able to say it tonight. We might not be what we want to be, and we might not be what we want to be, but and what we ought to be, but we know something has happened. We're not what we used to be. I know that because you have passed from death unto life. There's something has happened, and we know it. Something taking place down in our lives. That makes us Abraham. Seed, because we are in Christ. Now, his seed, now Jesus said about the seed, he said this, that it would be far better that a millstone to be hanged at your neck and drowned in the depths of the sea than even to offend this seed of Abraham. The least of these that believe in me, it would be, uh, and God told Abraham, whoever blesses you, I'll bless them, and whoever curses you, I'll curse them. Now, a little later on in the week now, I'm going to get the seal of God and the mark of the beast. And there's about two nights on that. I want you to be sure to get it if you can. You hear so many charts and things. But watch how simple it is when the Bible brings it out. How easy it is to see it. Uh, Now, the pro and con of it. Now, if you'll notice, he said that he would bless who Abraham, who blessed Abraham and his seed, would be blessed, and he would curse ever who cursed Abraham. Now, you just watch that in the Jewish people and see what's happened. Watch that amongst Christians see what's happened. Always that way. So, you see, you will possess the gate of the enemy. Let's go back and find some of the man of Abraham's seed under the Jewish covenant and then bring it down into the Gentiles when we were drafted over from the Jewish age to the Gentile age to take a people for his name. Now, let's take some of the man who... It was the seed of Abraham, and see if they possessed the gate of the enemy. Let's take, for instance, now let's speak a moment upon the, when the children of Israel had been carried away captive down into Babylon. There come a time first that there had to come a trial. There's always trials. It's always darkness before day in, in nature. And you always have trials before you have victory. If there's no war, then there's no victory. And now, the Hebrew children down there have been brought on to a spot where the king had made a, a declaration that anybody would not bow down to this image would be thrown into a fire of furnace. Furnace to fire, rather. And then when they... That purpose in their heart that they was not going to defile themselves. They were going to live close to God. Now the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were the seed of Abraham. They had the promise of God that his seed would possess the enemy's gates. Now, I'd imagine when a trial comes up, what's the first thing a child of God has for refuge when a trial comes? The greatest Weapon was ever put in the hands of mankind. Prayer. It even changes everything. It even changed the mind of God one time. God told his prophet, go up and tell the king he's going to die. And the king turned his face to the wall and said, Lord, I beseech you to consider me. I have walked before you with a perfect heart. I need 15 years longer. And God spared his life 15 years longer. Prayer changes things. Then we notice then when these Hebrew children come to a prayer meeting that night. What are we going to do? There had to be a, a gathering and a decision had to be made. No doubt they prayed all night long. And the decision was unanimously because they were deciding that they could not afford to go back on God in the time of trial. Wouldn't that be good for the whole church now? When the decision is made, shall I turn to the things of the world? Shall I go like the rest of them go? That decision comes to every Christian. It comes to you daily. How are we going to do it? 
You've got to make your decision. And they made their decision that regardless of what taken place, they wasn't going to turn away from God. That's right, because they had the promise of God that they were Abraham's seed and they know their position and know where they were standing. And they told the king, they said, now, uh, they said, we're going to throw you into this fiery furnace if you do not bow down to this God. And he said, king, live forever. Our God is able to deliver us in that fiery furnace. He's able to do it. But if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down to that image. We've made up our mind. We've tucked away with the Lord's despised you, and we're going to stand true to it. Oh, my. That's what the church needs. Now, you must take that same initiative when it comes to divine healing. When it comes to anything that God's promised, take the initiative and stand there. God made the promise. Yes, amen. He's obligated to his promise as long as you're Abraham's seed. He's got the answer. Now, don't get any doubts in your mind. Keep them doubts away. Just stay right straight on the cross. Now, look right straight to the one who made the promise. I've never seen him fail yet. I've never read of him failing. And you never will. Because he can't fail. He's God. He made the promise. He made it way back here in Genesis. That's the seed chapter. And uh, your seed shall possess the gate of the enemies. Not a enemy. The enemies. They are one of them. All of them. Now this enemy was the fiery furnace. So I could imagine that morning, let's just dramatize this just a little bit. It seems real good to my heart. When I see, you know, after they've made the decision, I believe God hears, but God don't always have to answer prayer, I think. See? God answers in his own time. If you ask him and believe him, then he'll answer in his own time. So I imagine a glory that was, uh, when this spring, I see the angels standing around the throne of where God was sitting. Saying they're in prayer, they're under strain. Yeah, but they'll hold out true. I've got confidence in them. They're my servant Abraham's seed, so they'll hold true. Well, the next morning, the king might have said, Have you decided now that you're going to uh, bow down to my God? He said, No, we're not going to bow down. Well, we just it raged his uh, indignation in him. He hit the furnace seven times harder than it ever was hit. And he took some big strong man. They started walking up to drop off into the furnace. And as they walked up close, it looked like the dark hour was there. That's the way it looks to Christians sometimes when somebody, the young lady, when she's been persuaded by a boy that she really loves to take her first cigarette, when she's forced maybe to take a, a drink for her first time, have her first cocktail at the party of the boss that she works for, or the man who's got a wife and family at home when the immoral woman tries to uh, make love to him. You've got those barriers at the gate. But if you'll just look like God forsaken you, just keep walking steady. Watching, just keep moving on. Yeah. And they walk right up and you know, we're the one who gets nervous. What about you accept your healing night after night? Well, you think, oh, tomorrow, I, I'm, I'm still coughing, my hand's still crippled, I don't have one thing to do with it. When you have really, honestly, from the depths of your heart, accepted that, as the finished work that Christ did for you, it's finished. It's all of it. Yes, sir. Just stay right with it. Now, they kept walking. I can imagine Shadrach was going to Meshach and said, You sure we're prayed up? Well, yeah. <laughs> Walk right on. Furnace getting hotter and hotter. They're almost the skin coming off of their face. Even the Bible said that the man that threw them in there, the intense heat of that furnace, killed the man that threw them in. Looked like it was the darkest hour. It walked right up to the edge of the furnace. But you know, it's sometimes God lets it get that way to try. You can never, Abraham would have never possessed the gate of the enemy until he was tried first. And you'll never possess the gate of the enemy until you go through the trials. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the trials, but all through the blood. God leads his children. See, you must first be tried. Oh, then the illegitimate falls in the trial. But the true child of God stands true. He knows where his possession lays. He knows where he's standing. He knows what's happened to him. He knows that he's passed from death unto life. And he knows that God answers prayer. Now, we see him going up. 
just if one step from going into the fire furnace looks like that they're completely defeated. It may be down I've seen cancer cases come to almost your last breath. A brother laying with arthritis recently had his hands laying like this. The Holy Spirit told him, said, Thus saith the Lord, you're healed. He went home and got worse. He said, I can't help it. That man didn't know me. He never seen me in his life. Lived in Phoenix. He said, he never seen me in his eyes. How could he tell me who I was? I know, but the man's talking, he's no educator. I know that there was something supernatural. And I, something happened. It couldn't even move the pillow. When they moved the pillow for his hand, he said, oh, wife, wife, be careful. Oh, we're just screaming. And she said, honey, aren't you afraid you're bringing a reproach up on the very religion that we He said, I cannot. I believe it in my heart that it will happen. And it got so bad, he laid back and his little girl was trying to put a wet rag on his face. He felt fainting. And he looked up there and he said he'd seen Christ come before him on the cross. And said when he bowed his head to die, he thought his breath was going, he couldn't breathe no more. The arthritis was all through him. And when he bowed his head to die, he seen Christ bow his head there. All of a sudden he'd give a big leap and out of the church and around the place like that. And that's why he said, the take the trial. The Hebrew children was at that place. Sometimes we think it's real dark. But remember, it's in the darkest of hour when Jesus comes by. Is it Mary and Martha, the little sisters of the Lazarus, Christian family, had left the synagogue to believe on the Lord Jesus. And it was their darkest hour. They come out of the church. They couldn't go back no more. Every who uh, professed to be a follower of Jesus was excommunicated from the church because he was a, a radical, somebody going around tearing up their churches and they didn't want that. So they said, anybody tries to follow him, I will throw you out of fellowship. So they were out of the fellowship and they couldn't return back to church. They would become heretics. And then the very man that they come out for, the Lord Jesus, the very man they... Come out far. They sent for him to come pray for their brother when he was laying dying with hemorrhages. And they, he refused to come. They sent the second time and he refused to come. Oh, how dark the hour was. And finally the midnight hour comes. Stop. And the boy died. They put him in the grave. He was there four days. Corruption had already set in his body. Skin worms was in him. Bugs from the ground was crawling into his flesh. The darkest hour they ever seen. It was at that time when Jesus came by. Yes. Just at that dark hour. Yes. Oh, a woman that said, now I'm going to say, Brother Branham, I told about raising Lazarus, said, you don't mean to, you bragged too much about Jesus being divine. I said, he was divine. Yes. yes. She said, well, I'll prove to you by your Bible he wasn't. I said, go to it. And she said, oh, well, this 11th chapter of St. John said he went to the grave of Lazarus. He wept. I said, that didn't, that didn't have to do with it. He was both man and God. I said, he was a man, truly, when he was weeping. But when he stood by the side of a man's grave that had been dead four days and his nose already fell in, the bugs eating in his body, he said, Andrew, come forth! That's up more than a man. Yes, sir. Uh, he was a man when he come down off the mountain that night looking around for something to eat on that olive tree and they found nothing there. He was a man when he was hungry. But when he took five biscuits and two pieces of fish and fed five thousand, that was more than a man. Yes, sir. That was God in that man. Yes, sir. He was a man laying out on the back of that little ship that night. There was 40,000 of them of the sea swore they had drowned in that little old ship like a bottle stopper out there, flopping around. The devil said, we got him now. He's asleep. We'll drown him. He was a man, tired and weary, laying out on the back of that boat there on a pillar somewhere asleep. But, brother, when he wants to roll, yeah. oh my, yeah. he looked up on the way of the boat, looked up and said, Steve, be still, yeah. and the winds and the waves are yeah. That was God in that man. It was the man that cried for mercy on the cross. That's right. My God, why has thou forsaken me? He died crying for mercy. That's right. But on that third morning when he broke death, yeah. he and rose again on the third day and ascended on high. He was more than a man. Everybody's ever mounted anything, believe that. That's 
right. Poets, authors, prophets, whatever more, believe that. Now the Hebrew children are going through their trial. There's right up to the last moment. And they're just ready to step into the furnace. You know what? <clears throat> Sometimes we watch things going on here on earth, but there's something going on in heaven all the same time. <clears throat> we might not be able to see it, but it's going on anyhow. <clears throat> Pardon me. Let's turn our camera now towards heaven. I can see Jesus sitting on the throne. Coming daylight. Smoke's raising way up in the skies from the furnace. I see him sitting there watching now and see what they're going to do. That's what he does to you and I when we're tried. He promised that the seed of Abraham would possess the gate of the enemy. I believe that. I see him watching. All at once a great angel comes up to his right side, hands at attention, puts his hand on his sword. Gabriel said, Father, have you looked down there? You're the seed of Abraham. You're, they believe in you. They pray it all right. And they're going right into their death. Let me go down there. I'll change the scene. I believe he could have done it. That's right. There's the house right, Gable. You're a good angel. Just stand there. Here comes another one up. His name's Wormwood. He's the a, a angel over all the waters. I see him standing at attention. But Father, have you looked down at Babylon? Yeah, I watched him all night. Oh, his eye is on the sparrow. <laughs> and I know he watches me. I've watched them all night. They're fixing to burn three men up down there this morning. Seeds of Abraham has stuck you by your word and standing gallant. You know, one time you told me to turn us all the waters. I had the control. You let me go down. I'll wash Babylon off the map. <laughs> he could have done it. I can hear him say, that's right. Wormwood, you're a wonderful angel. You, you did just exactly everything I told you since you created it. I created you. You did too, Gabriel. But you know, I'm going down myself. This is my job. No. <laughs> just when he's ready to take the last step, I just see him stand up, his priestly robe to drop around him where he stays tonight. They're bloody, making intercession for our confession. For he dies to bring the past anything that we ask. Where is our faith at him? There he stands up, motions that way, and here comes a big white cloud by, steps up on it, calls the east wind, north wind, south wind, and west wind to drive my horses, reach up and get a hold of a zigzag like you, crack it across the sky. Before they could ever step in there, he was in the fiery furnace with them. He stood in there with a big palm fan off there somewhere with a tree of life, fanning the fiery blazes off, something like that. They just want to talk it over with you, children. I know that you're the seed of Abraham. I gave the promise. And you're here. And you're here. Keeping the fire blazing on. Oh, yes. He opened up and said, How many did you put in there? So three. He said, There's one boy in there. He looks like the Son of God. He was. Why? They, after they were tried, they possessed the gate of the enemy. Yeah. Amen. Daniel was brought to the same thing. As he is put to a trial, whether we pray or not, he raised the curtains back, showed up the shades, and knelt down and prayed just like he always did. Yes, sir. Prayed just like he always did. And what happened? They went through the trial. They said, we'll feed you to the lions, and they've been starved for weeks. He said, my God's able to deliver me from that lion. But as he went through the trial, what happened? He possessed the gate of the enemy. Why? He was true to God. Moses, after he had been true to God, come to the trial and brought the children of Israel right in the path of duty. All nature screamed out against it. There was the mountains on one side and the deserts, Pharaoh's army pursuing, and the Red Sea dropped them all. While they were trapped, looked like God was a poor military man to push them right into that corner there and let them perish. God loves to do that. God loves to show his hand mighty. Yes, yes. yes, he does. He likes to show his power. He's waiting tonight to show to you to take that sinner and turn him around. Yes, take that woman of ill fame and change her to a godly, saintly woman. Take that girl who's taken the wrong road, that boy the wrong road, bring him back to the place to make sons and daughters of God out of him. Yes, yes, yes. He's ready to 
you'll take that man dying with cancer, that with heart trouble, that was blind, that was afflicted. If you just place his face in there, turn him around from death into life. Start him off with a testimony. He's waiting to do it. He puts you right in the trap to see what you do. He put him right down that trap there. Look like nature itself was hiding its face. Yes, one writer said one time that when they got in that place, we'll know what Moses would do. It has one of command, go forward. If you're in the line of duty, no matter what stays in the way, the greatest experiences I've ever had is to come up against something I couldn't get over to under. Just stand there and watch God make a way through it. That's the way to do it. Just move, keep moving. Press your nose against it, just keep moving on. Just keep going on. God will make a way. The old color man down south, carrying a Bible, said, Why can't I Bible for a moment? She can't read, said, I believe it. He said, Well, how, how do you know it's right? He said, Well, it's a believer from kiver to kiver to kiver also. It says it's got a holy Bible wrote on it. So I guess you believe all that's in there. I said, Yes, sir. I guess you believe whatever God will tell you to do, you do it. He said, I do it. So I you tell you to jump through that wall, and that stone wall, how are you going to get through there? He said, if you'd tell me to jump, I'd jump. You'd make a hole when I got there. So that's right. So that's the thing you have to do is take God and breathe it and jump anyhow. Amen. Hallelujah. If you know you could explain it, understand it, then it wouldn't be faith no more. Your faith is what you believe that he has done for you. And faith is the substance of things. Hope part, the evidence of things not seen. You don't teach, you can't figure it out. There's no way to figure out God. You just got to believe him and keep walking on. He said so. That's why I stand the focus for the visions. That's what he tells me, go do certain things. It seems humanly impossible, and you all know that. It is humanly impossible, but he said, do it. Just go on. He's the one to take care of it, and he will do it. Yes. How great thou art when Moses was trapped in this place here. Now he's right in the line of duty. Right in the line of duty. God led him right down there. What's he going to do? The Red Sea of traps said exactly. But Moses just marched forward on. One writer of these said that God looked down through that pillar of fire with angry eyes. Looked out that Red Sea that was trying to cut off his children in the line of duty and said the sea got scared and rolled back and just made a path for him. Well, if he could look through a pillar of fire and do that, what would he do when he looked through the blood of his own son? Had a confessor standing there with a promise that God swore he'd take care of it and swore that he would, uh, his seed of Abraham should possess. That's the gates of the enemy. Yes. Sure, he's duty bound to do it by the blood of his own son laying on the mercy seat tonight. Oh, if we could get away from this earth bound ideas, look up down there, see who made the promise, the very God of creation. Yes, Joshua. Also, after he had a trial at Katie's come back, 90% of the ministers said, We can't take it. Joshua said, We're more than able to take it. Him and Caleb, and he is the only two out of the two and a half million people that went over. What did he do? He come down to Jordan, holding out of the promised land, but he possessed the gate of the enemy. Why? Because he took God at his word. He'd had a trial, and he believed it. He knows God kept his word. So he possessed the gate of the enemy. I could go on and on, but I'm over time. All these great warriors, every one of them, they've done great things. They, they, uh, great miracles, and wandered about in sheepskins, and deserts, and the destitute, and some saw the thunder. All different things as Hebrews 11 say. All these great warriors all come down to die. Every one of them come down to die. But one day, one glorious day, that royal seed of Abraham comes. Born of a virgin. Yes. When he walked the earth, he was the true seed of Abraham. He walked the earth, he possessed the gate of sickness for the people. He possessed the gate of affliction. All you in the garden of Gethsemane, in the court that morning, he possessed the gates of temptation. Up on Mount Transfiguration, there he proved himself. When the devil took him up to another mountain, he possessed the power over the enemy to show he could do it. If thou be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. He didn't have to do it. He said, It's written, man shall not live by bread alone. He took the word of God because he was a true seed of Abraham and possessed every blessing that God Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Stood there under temptation that I'd speak straightway to my father and he'd send me 20 legions of angels. What could one do? 20 legions of angels. They could change it if they wanted to. That's right. But he had to be tempted in all manners like we are. 
sitting there with handfuls of beads and shot in his face and blood and mockery, drunken spit from the soldiers hanging in his face. They put a rag over his head like this and hit him on top of the head with a reed. Said, now you said you was a prophet. You can read the mind of the people. Tell us who hit you. Tell us who hit you. He could have done it, but he'd been listening to the devil. He possessed the gate of the enemy. He stood the temptation. Oh, God, for such a one. That's right. Then when he died down at the cross, hell put, taken his precious soul. The Bible said his soul ascended into hell. That's exactly right. Hell captured his soul and took him down there. But brother, on that third day, he possessed the gates of death. Hell in the grave. He rose down the third day. He overcome it all. He took sickness, death, hell, the grave, and everything. I believe he jerked the gates from off the hinges of the sucker. Come on. Rose on high. Rose on high. Rose on high. Tonight, you are more than conquerors. Shall possess the gates of the enemy. Yes. yes, sir. He possessed every gate. He conquered every sickness. He conquered every sin. He conquered every temptation. He conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. He possessed the gate of all of them. And we and him are more than conquerors while we're in him. So he conquered for us. Yes. Oh, we had ever know what that true seed of Abraham was. What it really meant to us. The devil doubted him. The devil, that was one time he had the wool, as we call it, pulled over his eyes. When he took him up on the mountain, as I was speaking of a few moments ago, he said, could that be? That man's just a prophet. Could he be the Son of God? He said, if thou be the Son of God, show he out of it. If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread, because you're hungry, you've been fasting 40 days. Eat. Jesus said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone. Took him up on the pinnacle of the temple and said, cast yourself down, because it's written. He gave an angel's charge concerning that then time to ask for to get a stone. It barely up. He said, yes, and it's also written. Everything he met him with the word of God, because he was a true seed of Abraham, he possessed every gate of temptation. Oh, how he did. He was a man. He was a man like you are, like I am. He had a right to be married. He had a right to have a home. He had a right to the things that we have. He had a right to have clothes. He could have done it. A man that could turn... Water into wine and could know where a coin was in a fish's mouth while he owned the heavens and earth. But yet he abstained from those things. The sweetest words in the Bible when he said, Father, I sanctify myself that I might sanctify them. Yeah. What was he trying to do? Set an example. He was sending 12 men out with a gospel that would conquer the world. And he's depending on you and I to do it. If he could sanctify himself like that, why ought we to set aside every failure, every doubt, and every pain else and sanctify ourselves? For we are the seed of Abraham to him. And the more than conquers to him. Young. He had a right to be married. He had a right to have a home. He had a right to lay his head on a pillar. But the foxes has beans and the birds has nests. And the son of man knows how place to lay his head. Why, I sanctify myself, Father, for their sake I do it. For their sake, not because he had to, but for their sake, he conquered every enemy. Standing there in the courtroom that day of the courtyard, when he did trial and falsely accused, the only thing they found against him was breaking the Sabbath day. He said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath, and he was, making himself God, and he was God. And there are all those false accusers and things and false witnesses they had against him. Finally, beaten with a big lash till his ribs are showing through. And a little robe he had on his back to tuck it off. Beat him to a post. What was it? That was a true royal seed of Abraham. That's where we stand tonight. Our faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. When all around my soul gives way, then he's all my hope and stay. But on Christ that solid rock I stand, all other grounds is sinking. All other grounds is sinking. There's where I take my hope. Right there on that solid rock. Abraham see, he possessed every gate even to death and hell. See him there. Had a mockery, that woman trying to wash his feet again. Put a rag over his face and said, if you're a prophet, tell us who hit you. We'll believe you. On the cross, he said, if you are the Son of God, come down and we'll believe you. They would believe him anyhow. No matter what he done. He didn't mind them. Let's take a little look at him this morning, or tonight. It's a terrible morning. 
that morning. We're back in the room. Let's just, I'm going to take this congregation. I want you to look at something. Let's go over to the window. I hear a howling mob. What's the matter? Raise up the curtain and look out. I hear something bumping coming down the street. What is it? The cross dragging around down the street. Bumpy bump. All them old cobblestones going up to Golgotha. That's the seed of Abraham. There goes the second Adam in the Garden of Eden when God had to his holiness and true to his word. When Eve and Adam had done evil, when God himself running up down through the garden hall and Adam, Adam, where art thou? Where art thou, Adam? If somebody wants to know where, who this man was, Jesus, who was to come hunting his first lost son? Did God send an angel? He come himself. He came himself. That's how he come. You want to make justice. There's not justice. There's no law. If you don't have justice, judgment to go with it, there's no need to have it all. What you used to have in law says ten dollars fine to run the stoplight and then don't, uh, say don't run the stoplight and no fine behind it, no penalty to pay, no judgment. Without judgment, there's no justice. So his justice was to die. So it's the only thing he could do. And then when he seen Eve, he got that beautiful little woman, that real masculine man standing there, those big brawny muscles and the blood running off his arms and old bloody sheep skin. Little Eve standing there, the most beautiful woman ever was in the world because she was created by God's own hand. Her eyes were like the stars of heaven. She didn't need match facts and stuff to make her pretty. And her head over like this and there, she was standing there, the blood running down her beautiful little body standing there, looking in the face of God and that big light hanging out in those palm trees. Depart out of my presence. I watch Adam as he starts away and across his legs. I'm old bloody sheep skins beating like that across his legs. He couldn't stand it. He's a father. He said, just a minute. I'll put enmity between your seed and the serpent seed. Where was it? Here it was at Calvary. Here he goes up this second Adam. God himself come down and made man going up the hill. The devil always did hate that word, but that's right. Yes, sir. He was more than a prophet. People today was this socialized religion saying that Jesus is just a good man, a, a philosopher. It's good to hear his teaching. If he wasn't God, if that wasn't Emmanuel's blood, then he was a man like I am. That's right. And we're lost. He was God. God, the Holy Ghost, overshadowed Mary to create a blood cell that brought forth not a Jewish blood, not a Gentile blood, but God's own blood. Blood comes from the male sex. This is a created blood, no sex into it at all. And that was God himself going walking up the hill there. Let's look at him. He had a little rope saw across his shoulders. His walls threw out without seeing. I notice as he goes walking, I'm looking at him by faith, showing him to you all by faith. His little red dots all over the back of that coat. What makes that like that? As he goes farther up the street and the cross of rubbing on his shoulder, I notice some little dots begin to get bigger and bigger. What are they? What's the matter? All at once, they all become one great, big, bloody splash. Then I hear something else speak against his legs. Second Adam, going up the hill with a bloody garment beating against his legs. You know, Satan said, looked around and said, you know what? I don't even believe he's a prophet now. I know that can't be God. God will never act like that. Let that mocking bunch of drunkards run over him like that. Let him call him Holy Roller. I'm talking to you. <laughs> Let him call him old model, something like that. You're an old fanatic. He'd never do that. But if he was God, his kingdom is from above. His delegates is the same thing. Their kingdom is above. They act like from up there. They talk about up there. Where their treasure is, there their heart is also. They're talking about that as he walks on up the hill. I can see that death. Satan sent that death thing down there. It's the ground to get him now. They so go down and get him. Now's the time to get him. That bee, like a big old bee of death, begin to buzz around him, humming around around him. And yeah, look at him bleeding. Look at him spit all over his face. Look at him all laughing, making fun of him. I see a little woman run out and say, What did he do? What evil has he done? What did he do but preach us the gospel? What did he do but heal your sick? Somebody smacked her out of the way. Said, Would you listen to that crazy woman sit here, please? Go on, up the hill with him. They beat him again. He goes on up the hill. The bee says, I'll get him after a while. I want to hang him on the cross. You know, all insects, bees, and things have the same. 
and death is to be hit as a stinger. But you know what? When one of them ever anchor his stinger real deep, he pulls his stinger out. Brother, when he stopped his finger into that flesh, that wasn't a man. He anchored his flesh in Emmanuel. And when he did, he pulled his finger out. I'll tell you to Abraham, seek out. He can buzz and make a noise, but he can't have no sting. One of them coming to his death said, Oh, Jack, where is our sting? Hey, where is our sting? Noise and fuss and poor hospital uh, in the hospital and tell the doctor to stand there in a bunch of mourning and crying, but she can look him in the face and say, Jack, where is our finger? I can point down to the royal seat of Abraham, whose blood I was born by. He pulled a finger out of there. So, death, you have no finger for me. Say, I'll mold you someday. Where is your victory? But thank be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. When his seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Possess the gate of all of his enemies. And when he come, he possess every gate. The gate of sickness, the gate of death, the gate of hell, the gate of temptation, the gate of the grave. He possessed every gate and freely gives it to us and makes us more than conquerors to him that loved us and gave himself for us. Let's bow our heads just a moment while we think about that. I wonder tonight, if by chance, how many is in this building here that doesn't know him as your Savior, and you know that your life is not right with God? Would you raise up your hand and say, pray for me, Brother Bram, in this closing prayer, I want you to pray for me. God bless you. Back over in the corner. God bless you way back there, lady. But would there be some more? How many more? Up in the balcony. Can I see some hands up there? Of all those people, God bless you back there. God bless you here, lady. Would someone else? Just raise your hand. It won't hurt you. My, just raise up your hand and say, I, you know yourself. Say, Brother Branham, I'm not Abraham's seed. I belong to church. God bless you here, sir. Uh, I'm not Abraham's seed. God bless you, lady. I hear the Lord be rich to you tonight. Over to my right. Yes, the Lord bless you. Somebody else. Say, raise up your hand. and Just raise up your hand and say, remember me, Brother Branham, in your prayer. I want to, I want to be Abraham's seed. Because remember, if you're not Abraham's seed, you're not in the promise. Uh, you may belong to some church, and that's all right. Yes, sir. I have nothing against you belonging to church. I think that's a good thing. But, brother, sister, that will not help you one bit at the hour of your death or at the coming of the Lord Jesus. You'll have to be Abraham's seed. And the only way you can be Abraham's seed is to deny your own self and die to your own self and be born again of the Holy Spirit. Because the life that was in Christ makes us Abraham's seed. We take on his seed by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us by the promise of God. And the promise is to you and to your children, the then and far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Eight or ten hands has been up. Would there be some more? With honest sincerity, just be honest with yourself. If you're a church member, we're not asking you to come join this church. No, we just want you to be an Abraham's seed. Brother, sister, I may never lay eyes again on you in this life, but there at the judgment bar I'm going to have to face you. See, I remember this night, the 13th day of February, 1961, when this day rolls up there on the canvas of the skies of the judgment, this meeting will come to your remembrance. God bless you over against the wall there. I want to believe on Jesus. I want to become Abraham's seed tonight. I bought, the Bible said, that which is outwardly is not Jew, but that which is inwardly. His, his seed shall possess the gate of the enemy. we got the enemy on the run now. Ten or twelve hands has been up already that we show that we got the enemy on the run. Would there be another and join our ranks tonight and raise your hands and say, God bless you, sir. God bless you. Would there be back there? God bless you back there. Yes, sir. Up in the balcony, the Lord bless you. Yes. Join our ranks. We got the enemy running now. Last night we got him started on from the sick people. Just look at the cancer cases and all was delivered here last night. The enemies are moving now. Last week we just battled and cut and everything we could, but we got the enemy moving. See? Yes. Now many's coming up, coming out of the ranks, take filing right in. There is. Won't you come join with us tonight? 
join your hands with God tonight, become dead to the things of the world, and accept Christ as your Savior? Will you raise your hand before we pray? Say, remember, God bless you back there in the back. I can see your hand up way back. Just another. What about somebody up close here? Not a Christian. Say, I want you to remember me, Brother Branham. Just pray for me while you're praying. Just remember me in your prayers. I'll do that. All right? Now let's keep our heads bowed. Now, Heavenly Father, there's none of us know that we'll be here tomorrow. This may be the last night on earth that we spend. This someday I'll close this Bible the last time. Sometime I'll close my eyes and bow my head for the last time. And each person in here will do the same. We don't know when that time coming, Lord. We know there's a great big dark chamber setting before every one of us. Every human being is called death. And as we think of the writer of the Anatopsy, every time our heart beats, we get one beat closer to that chamber. Every time our heart beats and that clock ticks, we're just one beat closer. And someday it's coming to its last beat. God. We do not desire, I'm pleading for these people, we do not desire to enter into that chamber screaming and crying and wishing for more life and a few minutes to repent. God, we want to come in there with the boldness. We will come in there as Abraham's seed, the promise in our heart, knowing this, that we know him in the power of his resurrection. But someday when he calls, we'll come out from among the dead and rise to go to be with him, to ever be with him. I pray for these who raise their hands, Lord. Many raise their hands. They're sincere, God. They, they didn't do that on their own power. There had to be a given power for them, and that was your power. And they raised up their hands that they were sincere in it. God it is written in the word that the affectional fervent prayer of a righteous man. Now, there's none of us righteous, but we are accepting his righteousness, and we're bringing his blood before you. We're bringing his word before you. Like he said, ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Now, we're bringing these people by faith right up before you, Lord. There they are. They've sinned. They've done wrong. They're wanting forgiveness of their sins. They raise their hands to you that, and for me to pray for them that they're sorry that they did that. Lord Jesus, forgive them. May they find that real sweet peace that passes understanding. Understanding that God so loved the world that he gave his Son that, that they might have the courage to raise their hands. And let them have this understanding too, Lord that they were chosen or they would have never raised their hand. For Jesus said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. Let them know that God the Father is standing by their side, speaking to their heart, and they've made this choice. He also said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has passed from death into life and shall never come to the judgment that's already passed from death to life. Got eternal life. Father God, you wouldn't turn one down. And I pray that you'll be merciful to thee. And I pray that you'll help them and to give them boldness now as I quoted this scripture. That it was you that made them raise their hand. For you said so, no man can come except my father draws him. And all that the Father has given me will come. And let them know upon that confession right there proves that you forgive their sins. Now, may they not be ashamed of it. May they stand boldly and say, Yes, I now accept it upon the basis of his word that I will never go into the judgment of the damned because God spoke to my heart and I raised my hand that I would accept him as my Savior. I wanted to be remembered in prayer. Grant it, Father. Now, with our heads back, I ask each one that raised their hand, if you believe what I'm telling you, Christians pray. God said this. 
Jesus said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. Now, what made you raise your hand? It's the Holy Spirit there telling you, convicting you that you're wrong. And all the Father has given me, or spoke to you, will come, and you did, raise up your hand. I'm a sinner. I won't forgive me if I did wrong. I will no wise cast him out, give him eternal life, raise him up the last day. Now, there's one more thing I want you to do. He that will confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father and the holy angels. Now, I'm asking you to do one thing in the goodness of God. Just think how good he was to let you raise your hand. I spoke to a young girl when I was yet a Baptist preacher. I was down in Nashville, Tennessee. And I felt led to tell her that I believe God was giving her a final call. She met me outside the church that night. And she said, don't you never embarrass me like that again. I said, I never embarrassed you. I hope not. She's a deacon's daughter. She said, I'm young, and I've got plenty of time to do that. I said, lady, I would have never pointed my finger to you if I didn't feel it. It was God. I never made an altar call if I didn't think. And she just bawled me out terribly. About two years later, I was down there with my old friend, Brother Marson, the Baptist Church, to have a, another meeting. And what I did, I walked down the street, and she was a nice young lady. She was walking down the street. It's been 25 years ago. And her underneath skirt hanging low. Oh, how foul she looked. I thought, that can't be that deacon's daughter. And she spied me. Tiny smiled, turned her head sideways. I walked over close to her. She said, hello, preacher. I said, how do you do? She stood there on the corner a little bit. said, come go with me to my room. I said, thank you. I'm kind of a bit hurry. She reached her pocketbook and said, have a cigarette? I said, no, aren't you ashamed to say that? She said, maybe you take a drink with me. I'll pay for it if you'll take it. I said, shame on you, lady. Would you be ashamed to ask the servant of Christ a thing like that? I started walking. I said, I'll be praying for you. She said, just a minute. There's no need. I said, why? She said, do you remember that night standing there by that rose bush inside of that Baptist church? And I said, yes. I said, my father's still deacon there. I said, you can tell us wherever you want to. Wherever you go if you want to. She said, that was my last call. She said, you know, since that time, said, I used to always feel a calling in my heart to come to God. She said, but since that time, she said, I've got harder and harder. Now, this is the statement the girl made. She said, my heart is so hard against God and against the church and everything that I could see my own mother's soul fry in hell like a pancake and laugh at it. See? Now, he's merciful to you. He knocked at your heart. And you raise up your hand, yes, Lord, I'm wrong. That was the Father. Now, will you confess him enough? Would you just stand up to your feet? I won't ask you to do nothing else. Just stand to your feet so that people can see that that was God knocked at your heart. Now, I remember real true children. God knocked at my heart. I want to stand to my feet just let the people know, God bless you, sir. God bless you, young man. Someone else stand up. That's right. All at night. I now believe. Just stand up just a moment. Just a moment. Please, just stand up just a moment, everyone. That's fine. Would there be another more to stand just at this time say, he knocked at my heart, never raised my hand, but I'm going to stand for him right now. I stand right now. I believe I'll stand for him right now because he knocked at my heart. I never want my heart to get in that bad condition like that. While it's tender, I will raise. Now, I say this to you, upon the authority of God's word, if you stand for him here, he'll stand to you as a judgment. He that confesses me before man, him will I confess before my Father and the holy angels. Yes. I would ask you people, you dear Christians, to just now become Christians in Christ. Just got the, the invitation to be Abraham's seed. Find some good church and be baptized. God bless you, sister, for standing up like that. That's very fine. Now, just remain standing. I want to pray for you again. And find some good church. Be baptized in Christian baptism and seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's young people standing, young men, and it would make ministers, missionaries. God bless your royal life. Now, you that have your head bowed, I want you to open your eyes and turn and look and see who it is. And I want you now, when we stand, to offer them the right hand of fellowship as Christian believers. Say, welcome. 
invite them to your church or something. Now let's all stand on our feet while you shake hands with them and say, Welcome into the kingdom of God tonight. Say, my blessed pilgrim brother. Turn around, each one of you, shake hands with them people now. As we sing, Just as I am. Christian, be real sweet. Yeah. I'm looking up in the balcony, a young man crying. People shake his head. Thou bids me come to says there's a prayer room downstairs. How do you get to it, brother? Just right through the gates. If you'd want to go down just a moment, I'll turn the service to him, and maybe some of you hasn't. How many hasn't got the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Raise up your hand and are seeking. You want to be. God bless you. Whosoever will, let him come. Is that right? Now, aren't you happy, you that's raised up and professed Christ tonight? If you feel real good about it in your heart, raise up your hand so that people see you. Raise your hand. You that come. Look at there. Every one of them, 100%. Yes, sir. That's it. How many of all of you are glad you're Christians tonight? Raise your hand. What does the Bible say? His seed shall possess the gate of the enemy. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We conquer tonight in Christ, our great conqueror. We broke down the walls of sin, broke down the walls of indifference, and souls marched into the kingdom of God. The rise up in the resurrection at the last day. Aren't we happy? All right, sister, I love him. I love him because he first loved me. Everybody, now, all together. I love him. I love him. Don't you love him? Now, don't leave. Now, I want you to do something for me. Now, when we sing it again, I want you to shake hands with somebody in front of you, somebody behind you, to the right and left, and say, God bless you, pilgrim brother or sister. Glad to be here in the house of God with you. Let's do it now while we sing. I